Nossa. Hey Bosa, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. All right, awesome. Cool. Just audio check. All right, let's wait a couple minutes.
Greetings. Hey, everyone. Cameron's here. Hey, Cameron. Uh, I'm, I put the uh, meeting docs in the chat, so um, you could go and put your name in the attendance. And uh, we also need one more scribe for today. So if you could help scribe for today's presentation with um, Jonathan, that would be great. All right, thanks, uh, Martin and Bosa, for describing today. Let me just see if Jonathan is here yet. He's just next to me and attempting to get Zoom working on this network. Yeah, that network doesn't sound very great. <laughs> you seem to be breaking up a little bit. Well, while we're waiting for things to work out, um, I'm kind of unclear on how I'm supposed to ask for some time in this meeting or subsequent meetings. Uh, myself and a couple of people here are from the Kubernetes security audit working group. And gotcha. we would like to chat with you guys, but we don't exactly know how. So if someone could guide us through the appropriate process, we would appreciate it. Right, so um, one of the, so for our six security sessions, we usually have um, every month is kind of a mix of presentations slash working meeting sessions. Okay. Um, so within the meeting um, notes doc uh, on the top, you will see um, the plan meeting. So there'll be a couple that, that we'll have there. And so if there's a topic um, that you'd like to, to discuss or talk about if you go to any of the um, working meetings and add uh, like a sentence or two um, and your name on what you'd like to talk about, uh, we will add it to the agenda. Okay, great. So we put it in the future meeting section. I'll move it maybe to the 29th working meeting and we'll all come back then. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, thank you guys so much. No worries. Um, so Jonathan, I see that you've joined. Hi, yes. Okay, Sorry great. Awesome, no worries. Um, yeah, so so just to that, um, the meeting notes is, I'm going to paste it again in the chat in case you can see it. Uh, add yourself to attendance. Um, next week, we have a working session. So if there are any issues that you'd like to discuss uh, on Calm PRs and things like that, or you have an item that you'd like to add to agenda, um, you can put it under the 29th of January working meeting um, in the meeting notes. Um, in two weeks, um, February 5th, we will have the Spiffy slash fire security review. So this will be a presentation from um, the species by folks about the technology, and then we'll have an open discussion after that. So, since we have a presentation today, um, we're going to skip check ins. Uh, today, we have Jonathan Meadows here with us. And um, I just believe, one, yeah, just one thing I don't know. It says it says host is not in the meeting, which I think it means it's not being recorded yet. That's not I, true, it's recorded. We are good. Yeah. Oh, it is. Okay, oh, we're good. Okay, just checking. Okay, thanks. 
Great. All right. Um, so today we have Jonathan uh, Meadows. I believe the topic is going to be on open source training materials. Is that right? It's also about some of the threat modeling uh, that we've been doing in the financial services user group. So there's a couple of items that we're bringing over from there. Just wanted to present and uh, ensure people. Great. So thank you for taking the time and um, please take the floor. Okay, great. So if I can uh, try and share my screen. Just bear with me. No, I can't. Two seconds. Uh, PowerPoint, I'm just trying to find the right screen. There we go. There, there, there we go. Excellent. All right. Present. There we go. In good shape. Excellent. All right. Yep. Great. So, um, <clears throat> yes, I uh, just want to uh, present uh, some of the work that we've been doing in the financial services user group. So we, we started this as part of the uh, one of the users groups at Barcelona uh, last year, and it's really for those um, companies in running in highly regulated environments. And it's usually the financial services. We have about 15 to 20 financial institutions working with us um, from large banks down to small fintechs. And um, the way that we've started it out is, is really looking across our industry and looking for what are the key issues that we're really, um, really concerned with, really preventing us from getting into Kubernetes or cloud native solutions. And what are the issues of the day? Uh, and surprisingly, they're, they're quite common. So if you look at our GitHub, you'll see that we've got uh, a number of the focus areas that we're starting to look into. Um, I think attendance is uh, a little bit sporadic. We're, we're really continuing to, to bring people in and sort of solidify the agenda. But one of the areas that we're, we've um, got uh, feedback on is, is some of the, the top focus areas that we've uh, managed to go out and actually start coding. So the top two items uh, are really around, you know, which controls can we actually install on Kubernetes and cloud native architectures? How can we test them? Something that's common across all of our, our members. And also how to address the skills gap. A lot of training out there, but we're, we're also competing for the same resources. So we've been looking into that. So those are the two top ones we've been focusing on uh, and really focusing on not just talking about them and exchanging ideas, but trying to come up with solutions uh, and, and solutions we can share in the open source community. So starting off with the controls, the approach we took was really looking at um, threat modeling the Kubernetes infrastructure itself. So it was quite an ambitious start, but really using that as a mechanism of identifying the, uh, the vulnerabilities and the, the attacks that could possibly be um, executed against Kubernetes and get a real understanding of where the controls needed to be applied. Um, at that time, we as a group looked out to see if there was anyone doing this sort of work. Uh, I think that was probably early last year and uh, we couldn't find anyone specifically looking at it. Subsequently, we found two or three people, including the, the um, very, very good detailed audit uh, from um, trail of bits that have also got some threat modeling in there. But at that point, we didn't have any anything to go on. So we were really starting from scratch. And we reached out to um, some of the chaps at Control Plane who are with me here today as well, Andy uh, Martin, uh, to ask them to come in and help us as a group uh, and, and detail it. Now, what we were doing with these threat models and, and we started to use attack trees is trying to identify these attacks. But we're then using that as a mechanism of mapping out where within that attack tree we could apply a particular control, whether it's detective, uh, preventive, or responsive. But there was a real um, 
push from the group to focus on how we'd actually automate those regression tests and automate that testing. That's something that we started to build out, um, not only from a, a visual representation we can show you, but also starting to write tests to try and validate that threat model. We haven't really seen many other people do that yet. Um, be open to suggestions and, and sort of pointers to see if someone has looked at it. That's really one of the focus areas. The, the other bit that has really helped our members is, is a mechanism of demonstrating uh, the threats that Kubernetes can come under to multiple different partners. It's not just the blue team that would be used to, uh, to show this. It's our security operations center and forensics team. And this has actually been one of the real benefits of this approach. Um, we've been able to show how attackers get into the system or how they could get into the system and use that to train our security operations team on what to look for and start to map out on the tree um, some of the attack vectors as they come through. And it's really helped uh, us define the content for uh, remediation and incident response, as well as the actual training. So that's something we didn't really anticipate when we were building it out, but uh, it's, it's probably one of the main benefits at this point. Um, so this is one of the pieces we've open sourced this in the CNCF. We'll share the, the link towards the end. But we started with mapping out the trust boundaries uh, around the different components within Kubernetes. Um, I think this has been very instructive uh, to our teams, how Kubernetes truly hangs together um, and gives a better understanding of the general architecture. Although obviously people are training, reading in the books and have a good understanding of it. When we start to map out the trust boundaries, I think it really has sort of brought that um, understanding to the fore. And then we start to get into some more of the attack trees. Do you want to pick up a bit, Andy? Yes. May I borrow your ah. <laughs> And I'll come back. Thank you. Right. So, uh, yeah, um, as we've said, we're looking to formally and methodically verify, uh, at the, well, describe the security of our systems and then verify them from an attacker's perspective. So um, we are all, all very focused on how to harden the cluster, but in order to apply those controls, we need to understand, of course, how they will be circumvented and what the routes into the cluster might be. Uh, so um, apologies to those of you that are familiar with attack trees already. Um, just uh, I'll run through these quickly. Um, these are typically devised using a top-down approach uh, these, what we'll see in the next couple of slides, are subsets simplified from the main tree, which we'll look at in a minute. Um, so we start with the negative outcome that we would like to avoid at the top of uh, this tree. And subsequently, we ask, how can that be achieved? So obviously, this is useful um, to gel with the mindset of most security teams who are used to thinking in terms of negative outcomes. Um, Obviously, we have a key here on the left. So um, simply, uh, and nodes require both actions and conditions joining the nodes to be true, whilst all nodes indicate what lies beneath can be realized in multiple ways. So one way to achieve this specific example, if we look at the content of this tree now, is to deploy a poisoned container image, which in turn requires that the container image is poisoned within the container registry. That potentially is through the compromise of uh, a pull secret, which is also incorrectly configured with writes or overwrite privileges. And of course, we would expect, well, we require the image to be deployed to the cluster. And in this case, we're relying on that as part of uh, a label overwrite and standard scale out or node addition churn. Subsequently, as we go down to uh, obtain image pull secret here, um, we can achieve that in one of three ways. And you see this is a, a green or node. We can obtain it via the Kubernetes API or a running container with host file system access or reading a Kubernetes secret from a misconfigured kubelet. So that, that is just a slice through um, one of the possible journeys through an attack tree. Uh, we can also invert the thing and uh, run the bottom up approach. Um, so, so in this simplified tree, we are looking at an attacker that is able to gain some small level of access and attempt to enumerate and pivot. So from the start point here at the bottom, we have an RCE in a container, and then we ask, what can we do now? Um, what would we like to do? 
Um, this diagram is a little bit hard to read. So if we zoom in on the lower half here, um, in this excerpt of the tree, we're focusing on how the container service account token, if sufficiently privileged, can be used to start pods, exec to a running container, or extract secrets. Yeah, in fact, just there, <coughs> this was this was actually I'm a bit work. This was actually um, really useful. In that it's perhaps not the um, the standard mechanism of doing threat modeling from the bottom up approach, but what we often found was in reality we're taking it from the perspective of well, we assume the attacker has already got to this point. What can they do? And from a, a SOC perspective or an incident response standpoint, it's really beneficial for us to look at it this way so that we can identify, right, so we've, we've actually covered up all these controls or um, we've looked at all of the content that we need to generate if certain things actually happen. So we decided to start doing it both ways from top down and bottom up, which probably doubled the amount of time we ended up doing it. But um, certainly got a lot of uh, a lot of use out of this particular approach. That one. I think we we'll probably just talk with it. Um, and and yeah, certainly in terms of the thought process and kind of mental abstractions that went into this exercise, um, certainly coming from the top down and the bottom up um, did expose some gaps in are thinking the first time round, so it was a useful sort of internal quality assurance, um, if you like. So um, just to, uh, well, sorry. I think the point out as well is, is as we were building out the attack tree, um, there was um, a couple of areas of the tree that we, we sort of identified, um, that although we didn't particularly find a, a CBE, there were certainly areas that were identified that subsequently someone published a CBE. Um, and as we were building it out, we were always looking at, right, so how can we evidence that? How can we write a test case to validate that we are or are not susceptible here at all? And it turns out, in many cases, couldn't quite think up of a particular idea. But lo and behold, two months down the line, someone else did. And it was actually within the tree. We just hadn't figured out how to exploit it. So um, I think that was um, that was interesting from a, um, a blue team perspective in that it's probably easy to actually write a detective control to see if someone is trying to do a certain thing as opposed to actually execute it. So we can think ahead of someone actually breaking in, uh, even though we couldn't evidence that someone could at that point. Thank you. Okay, so um, looking at, yes, we've got this RC in a container. Um, in this excerpt, we're just looking at starting pods, exactly to a running container, or extracting secrets. Uh, so subsequently, if we move further up, uh, we can see how this could lead to pulling or pushing images from an image repository or unauthorized access of data, crypto locking or ransomware, um, all that good stuff that we haven't necessarily seen uh, in Kubernetes yet, but uh, we're seeing far more widely. And okay, as, as we can see, these attack trees are not especially complex, but when composed into a greater diagram, are a useful tool to communicate our understanding of the security of a system. And back into John. We'll probably just leave the headphones, but um, so, so you can take a look at the, the threat models that we've open sourced them for a while now. Um, they, they are quite extensive. Um, I think we've got a more detailed version down here. Um, they are in Visio. Uh, it took me an awful long time putting them together in, in Visio. Um, and there's a number of different major scenarios you can take a look at. In terms of next step, though, we, we've really started to look at how we could automate it. We did look at it from the start, and we were trying to think of different ways of doing it. And realistically, we've come to the approach of trying to create these automated test cases that we'll, we will continue down. Um, I certainly want to do less Visio because my concern right from the start was as soon as I put it into a document, the document effectively becomes stale. How do I keep it updated? Um, and that's a, an ongoing challenge really. So if we're looking at putting it into some sort of automated format or at least data format so we can drive it for, further forward. Some of the challenges that I think we, we start to see is in reality as we were building out the test cases behind this, it, it's not a huge leap to, to think of them as effectively exploit code. 
is we're writing uh, an actual function uh, or, or a functional test to try and validate the security of the system. And the way you're doing that is effectively writing almost an exploit. So not particularly comfortable doing that and certainly not open sourcing that, but perhaps there is um, purchase in reaching out to some of the breach simulation companies and we've certainly started to do that. But perhaps that, that's something that they could look into or if anyone has any other ideas, I'd be open to uh, suggestions on, uh, on how we could get people to write uh, some of that um, exploit code or, or automate the tests is really what we're looking for. So I'll leave that one there um, if for anyone to take a, a look at uh, the actual link. And that's the, the first um, area we were looking at is the FSUG. Um, and come back for questions unless there's any now but um, the, the next step was addressing the skills gap so <clears throat> clearly there's a huge amount of um, focus in this area um, all of our members are looking to, to hire exactly the same people but in reality we need to train uh, a lot of the people we already have on staff and when we were doing some of the analysis there's huge amounts of documentation books and and slide web but in reality um, personally, I've seen a much better engagement and level of understanding when um, when developers and my staff uh, are using a hands-on system. We've implemented something and open sourced it before uh, for application security. I've done other things in this sort of area. And really, that's the key difference. I get huge amounts of better ret retention when people are... Um, actually getting the hands on within an IDE or within a, a command line and, and going through this. So we've basically built out uh, a hands on training system where you can stand up the infrastructure for Kubernetes, load in exercises, and then uh, at, attempt to, to uh, do a particular training, uh, training exercise. Now, it is sort of like a CTF but um, the real idea behind it is more on the remediation and blue side. Um, now, ultimately, the goal would be to allow the same exercise be deployed to a, uh, a user, and they'd go in and do the, the red team approach and try and break into a particular exercise. That same exercise would then be saved down, given to uh, the next team who would effectively do try and do forensics on that ex same exercise, and then back to the blue team who are trying and defend or, or mitigate those issues. And that way I get the sort of uh, the rapport building between the multiple teams and the ability to uh, train all of those teams together on effectively the same true exercise. And you get the blue team in a forensics looking at real data for someone who's actually tried to break in rather than, again, perhaps some slideware. So, so this is what we've built in open source. Do you want to take that one? I'll buy you some headphones. Okie dokie. So uh, yeah, um, ultimately this is a tool that allows learning and practicing on production-like infrastructure with impunity um, because it is uh, our shared belief that DevOps in general and perhaps uh, SecOps in particular really only rears the specter of re reality or realism um, when something is deployed in a, a non-trivial environment. So uh, simulator does a few things. It will wrap Terraform to stand up um, AWS infrastructure that is behind a bastion uh, to avoid drive-by ponage. Then uh, there is a scenario runner which will provision one of uh, currently 25 different scenarios onto the cluster that has incremental hints, uh, guidance, um, and is intended to cover a range of skill sets. This tool was originally built um, as part of Control Plane's sort of more general uh, cluster debugging and training and security um, at work. Uh, what we've open sourced here is very specifically um, all the security scenarios. Uh, but it is a, a generalized runner, of course. There's nothing really um, specific about the, the perturbations that security, uh, it, it's just a byproduct, let's say, of a different code path. Um, it is a raw command line experience, which means you're dropped into a shell and you're given access to any tooling that you so desire. Um, that shell is 
already relatively tooled up. Um, but should you want to pull Cube Hunter or, or whatever it is, then there's, there are no restrictions. Um, and then, yeah, the, the whole thing, of course, is open source. And um, I mentioned this as uh, a, a potential for something that we'll submit into the, uh, the CTF for um, SIG Security Day at KubeCon. Uh, so here are a list of the initial suite of scenarios. Um, these are attacks and remediations, and they take uh, inspiration from military terminology in homage to uh, the origins of red and blue teaming. Just to run through this one quickly, um, RBAC Sanger, uh, which is a fortified military position, I'm reliably informed. In this case, uh, we're looking at the audit logs and we notice that something is making calls which shouldn't be. So our, we have detected this visually instead of with an automated test. But nevertheless, we are then challenged with identifying the root cause of the problem, uh, correcting the, uh, let's say, Kubernetes uh, search front-end deployment. Very good. Okay, well, uh, correcting the deployment that is at fault in this case. Um, and then, uh, well, I, I could have summarized the whole thing, but there are discrete challenges in order to achieve um, all four of those tasks. And the remediation involves defense in depth. Um, so, of course, we're attempting to communicate what we consider best practice for these things. Uh, again, re review on these things would be very welcome because um, to some extent uh, there is uh, subjectivity involved. Um, it is possible to run all of this open source. Of course, be aware if you're doing this in your organization's billing accounts that these are willfully vulnerable um, and as such, um, yes, uh, by the way. Uh, and then, yeah, th just a, a moment discussing the lessons we're looking at. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so we, we spent a lot of time looking at um, the actual experience of how we were going to do that training and how it would uh, look to a developer. Because um, if you just stand up a Kubernetes cluster, some of the developers that we have perhaps aren't as familiar with running around. So there's, there's quite a lot of functionality within uh, the system to enable them just to jump between the different nodes or hosts or depending on what the uh, challenge is straight into that container. So it is quite a nice uh, sort of developer and end user experience. Um, a lot of the challenges that we've implemented there are really focused on the mitigation. But I, I strongly believe that to, to actually get to the point where you understand how to mitigate appropriately, you have to understand how to attack it in the first place. So that's why the hints came in. So a lot of the people aren't seasoned red teamers or pen testers. So, uh, worthwhile at least having a try but then we have the ability to give them a number of hints to get to at least the initial point of uh, breaking through a particular scenario and then really uh, the focus for that particular team would be on remediation and they can they can uh, they can get the value out of the remediation part of it um, the, the next steps really in, in this piece uh, are really centered around um, allowing a local development experience so at the moment, it does deploy all of the functionality into AWS. We have a, a bastion host in an environment we deploy it to. But often, um, I'd, I'd much prefer the ability to just do it on the train or, or give developers access to it in that way. So we looked at uh, Kind and a number of other op options. We'll be furthering that and, uh, and seeing where we get with that one. Um, and then the, the next big one for me is, is really the, completing the vision that I had for the project, which was try and get that multi-user experience going where we have the red team, blue team, and forensics team person involved in there. At the moment, it's effectively one exercise with limited save down, but uh, we'll, um, that's really the next challenge. So, so those, those are really just um, the, the, the two focus areas we've um, really dug into so far. Um, it's, um, it's certainly a work in progress and it's open for any commentary or feedback on either of those two. Um, we have uh, a whole list of additional focus areas that we're going to go through as a, um, an FSUG team. I think the next one's on codifying controls, which I know a lot of our team, uh, our, our members are really, uh, really focused on. Uh, we started to get into some of that as part of the threat modeling, uh, threat modeling work. So, 
um, I'll hand it back. Um, I'd, I'd really be interested in any feedback on the approaches that we've taken or um, anything that uh, is of interest or you've seen other people implement some of this uh, work around threat modeling or automating the testing around threat modeling. Um, yeah, just love to uh, love to hear your thoughts. Brendan, thank you. Great. Thanks, uh, Jonathan and Andy. Um, I think we have a couple of questions in the, the comments. I think there's one from Mark on uh, how this relates to MITRE. Yes, so um, that's a that's a great comment. So so we were looking at that, um, and that was before MITRE released the Cloud Attack Framework. Um, so we haven't mapped it directly to MITRE, um, but I think that's something that would certainly be possible. Um, and I'd be interested in doing that. Um, so we, just by coincidence, I uh, just ended a meeting in the last hour with MITRE and, you know, they have this center for threat intelligence that's trying to formalize this. And uh, we haven't, we, my company hasn't decided whether to join that because that's a pay as you go enterprise. Uh, but I do think there's, some, there's value in trying to align what you're trying to do, not just with MITRE in particular, but with the MITRE unified ontology, which is the language that we could use to automate this stuff. Chances are, I think what you're doing will get ahead of what MITRE is doing, you know, but MITRE might provide a commonality of frameworks that would leverage future work that you're doing. I'd, I'd be interested in taking that further, definitely. I'm sure everyone else in the group would be interested in that. Um, All right, so I'm, my company, I'm not a sponsored member in this group, but uh, I'm employed at Synchrony, who is a, you know, a Fortune 155 something in, in the US. So we're a sizable, you know, large firm involved in this. So, you know, I'll, I'll try to get involved to the extent that I can on an, on, on an unofficial basis. Yep, please drop me a note. So. Oh, we have another question from Justin Kapos um on attack trees do you do you want me to just say it because it's probably easier okay yeah that'd be good okay. so so one thing i found that was very interesting about your attack trees is that the nodes themselves are labeled with an and or an or relationship and uh, i've seen attack trees used in lots of cases but i've almost always seen it where the and or relationship is between the edges themselves and the reason why that makes some degree of difference is, um, let's say that there is an outcome that you know someone is going to break into your data center, and they could either um, like knock out the guard and steal their key and uh, open the door, or they could just blast through the wall or something like that, right? So there you have a situation where you you'd kind of have to either break it down and add additional intermediate nodes or other things like that. I'm wondering if you've, if you made a conscious choice to choose this style or whether this was something that happened or is there, is there a reason um, to do this or is it, would it have been cumbersome to do the other way? I, I, I wish it was a conscious decision, but uh, frankly it wasn't. Um, and uh, I, I, honestly, I think we were learning uh, as we went along in many ways. Um, as long as it means that I don't have to redo those Visio diagrams, I'd be open to anything, really. Um, so um, I I get it. It'd be interesting to see what difference that makes to the. Maybe we take one page and take a look and see how that would affect it. Um, okay, I, I don't know is the answer. I haven't I haven't tried that. I don't know the answer, um, but it'd be interesting to take a look. I think a, a lot of the value. We, I got out of it, we got out of it, was the kind of the discussion, discussion and the creation of, of that threat model. Um, just the, the conversations that were spilling out of that, those sessions were, um, um, you know, it really got us thinking about, actually, that's a real issue. We need to take a look at an evidence and put down in that document and diagram. Um, and if there's any way of more efficiently um, you know, memo memorializing that, um, I'd, I'd be very interested to take a look. Great. And since I have the I stole on the floor for a second, I'm going to steal it for one second longer. 
and just ask kind of follow up, which is that, have you looked at any of the other follow on things people often do with threat modeling where you tried to assign um, like risk probabilities to nodes or um, it did things like looked at collusion cases where an attacker has capabilities X and Y in a weird way that um, may allow you to break through different parts of the infrastructure or anything? Yeah, so, so one of the things that we, we, we haven't really um, open sourced is, is the probability. So we, we looked at the probabilities, but also, um, and, and I think that um, helped sway some of the other decisions we were making. Um, but also, um, again, more to the, the, the visualization of it, we were able to highlight the, the value of some tools. So we looked at the probability of what's the probability of X and Y and Z happening. And where are the tools that we've used, created or bought? And where are they actually providing that value? So if we've got, you know, 80% of you know, a high chance that this is going to happen, where are they on the attack tree? And if we've bought this very expensive tool, is it really the one that's catching the 80% or is it the one that's just about covering the 2%? Uh, and that was quite an interesting uh, visualization to overlay onto the thing. Um, so I haven't, um, we haven't updated the map, but if we, we effectively have multiple overlays onto it to, to show uh, these are the probabilities or this is mitigated, this isn't mitigated. Um, yeah, when we did a similar thing for Spiffy Spire, it was really, really illuminating. And we've done this in a few other contexts where the things that people thought were really important often weren't and vice versa. So. Well, one of the things I wanted to try and do, but I, I don't have any data, is um, is where do you get the probability from? Because it was effectively, we, we were effectively making it up, frankly, and maybe there's a better way of doing it. But I didn't have any TTP knowledge of back to the, the MITRE framework of who was actually exploiting it in this way. And if we had that capability and that data, I think it would have really, again, given another lens on this, as opposed to us thinking, if I was out there, what are the likelihood of me getting a service account or getting this key or that key? So if we can start to get some of that more probability data or attack-based data into it to, to um, evidence some of the probabilities, I think that'd be really interesting. But uh, your point's well made. It was, it was, it's pretty illuminating. That one diagram, you can get a lot out of it. Right, and and we had a similar problem. We actually had uh, different people independently try to come up with and justify a different score, and then we sat together and discussed. And we didn't ever really try to push people to change their score, but if you do some information you got from somebody else, you could. And then in the end, we we did kind of a a median sort of thing as a result of this, and. I think we were all pretty happy with, with how that came out. Um, but it, it's That's very hard. Real data. There isn't real data for most of these things, as far as I know. Right, but but I like the idea of getting a couple of different people's opinions and then perhaps applying that and open sourcing that. Um. Hey, folks. By the way, I was just listening, and me. This might seem blasphemous or it's maybe a little, uh, ignorance, but what I was thinking because the conversation became mathematically inclined and we were talking about ands and ors and then the Boolean logic, right? But we also talked about it from a probabilistic way. What I was thinking was more, what about doing some kind of ver formally verified threat modeling, right? Like because ands and ors are like Boolean logic, so how do we get there? If, if that's possible, that is. <laughs> I, I've thought about it. Um, I know uh, a number of members are doing uh, similar things around AWS. I would, I would be very interested to, to see how you would be able to do that with an open bounded problem like Kubernetes. Okay. There are, I, are I think I've seen in school better than I that could answer that. Uh, I've seen kind of these threat modelings being mapped onto logic systems, and I think they work very well with it because it's very, you know, uh, it's very structural. Um, I can't say I've seen um, the same with uh, formal verification. Okay. 
yeah, I, I couldn't find a way, but I'd be very interested to find if someone did. It's just, I, I'm thinking it's just too big a unbounded problem, but. Uh, gotcha, just, I was from, just asking as a curiosity, yeah, yeah. Uh, me too, I mean, I'd, I'd be very interested to find out if anyone's got a, an approach to that. Um, so I was, I was wondering, since we found the tread model, um, so it seems like um, this boundary that you had was between uh, components within a um, single registry cluster, but do you see the model being very similar when you bring it into a multi-cloud environment, or do you see more components at play now? Um, I think there'd probably be more components at play. In, in, um... It, this took a long time. I mean, if you, if you take a look at the PDFs, uh, this took a, a, a lot longer than perhaps it should. Uh, it was a couple of months. Um, and I, I had to, um, I had to bound it in, in certain ways. So it was single repository, single cluster. Uh, uh, there, will, there will absolutely be differences if it's multi-cloud. And the thing I was really, really interested in was the supply chain security and SDLC required to deploy Kubernetes and how that would affect it. That if, if when we go again, and we will go again, that's where, uh, that's where I think the next focus will be on uh, effectively. Well, first of all, finding out has anyone's already done that. And secondly, um, try and look at it from the, the supply chain perspective when, with, with respect to uh, Kubernetes. Well, you're working with the right groups there with control plane and stuff like that to answer to that. So, um, and, and there's uh yeah, you can, yeah. You can uh, <laughs> well, it's, for, for a number plane, of reasons, uh, <laughs> for a number of right. reasons, I'm not allowed to accept a gift like that, but, uh, there is an awfully nice hoodie. <laughs> yeah. The, the nice hoodies I've, I've seen out there before. So, um, yeah, but, but I, I think there's, uh, uh, you know, all, all kind of joking aside, um, you know, uh, of course, uh, others like uh, the people in SIG security are also, I think would be very interested in this. And I know we've also done a lot of work on sort of the threat landscape and things like that, that um, we're going to be very curious to do a deeper dive into some of the things that you produce there, because they're starting to look a lot like a work that Brandon and I has been doing, although we've been focusing more on um, you know, we're doing like a mock-up and the, the stuff we've been doing so far has focused very early on, like the software supply chain side of it. Um, whereas as your focus uh, seems to be later in the process. So I think there'd be some nice synergy. No, it, it, it really has been from a threat modeling standpoint. Um, that was the initial one. But in reality, again, a number of the FSUG uh, team are very, very heavily looking at uh, SDLC and supply chain, and I am uh, very focused on that too. So as I say, that that is going to be the next threat model, but also implementation. Um, personally, I'm I'm going into uh, uh, well some of the open source projects that have been discussed before um, to to make sure that we uh, cryptographically evidence and validate all of the individual points throughout that supply chain and look at uh, Look at implementing that, and I think, um, yeah. But just because we've only threat modeled the uh, the end side, the the runtime, um, everyone's also focused very much on the supply chain as well. That's next. I'm also I'm curious. Actually. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tara. Um, it seems like a lot of the work you've done isn't specific to the financial institutions. And so um, I think that if, you know, if you're open to it or whatever mechanism, we can link to the work that you're doing so that people, because people come to SIG Security looking for resources like this, and we don't have as many resources to point to as we'd like. And it's not that they're not out there. It's just a process of, you know, highlighting things and linking things. So it'd be great if offline we can kind of brainstorm, you know, or start an issue where we can be like, where would be a good place to put this? Um, so that, um, so we can make people aware of this. Yep. And I think the other thing that I wanna, like, I don't know the how, 
Um, yet I think that one of the things that uh, brings me to wanting to be involved in this group is in reality, this is unbounded, yet there are frameworks for thinking about this ca that can make it more approachable for people who are coming from a traditional security background into cloud native or the creator, like coming into the cloud and then adding security, which is frightening. Um, and that there might be a way that we can, um, you know, group things or, or do something that can make it just not seem like a 3000 point list, which is itself contributes to lack of security because if you can't execute on it, then you can't make things more secure. Yeah, and then maybe the, to, to Justin's point, if we stipulate the probabilities on some of these areas, it would help people focus down instead of 3000 points into some key areas perhaps. But but I'd certainly be open to hosting it elsewhere. It was, um, it was uh, from the group, but it's absolutely not uh, financially specific. Fabulous. Yeah, no, it's just been the... we can start with a link or whatever seems like the right thing to do. Yeah, I was just about to say when, when Sarah started talking that um, I've been working with this and it seems like the requirements for federal and financial seem to be overlapping quite a bit. So it seems like these trap models could definitely be, be, be used in the federal context as well. Uh, I can attest to that. As I've, I have a background on financial services and I can attest to that. Yes. Great. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to use them wherever it makes sense. Just one more point, I guess, on um, on uh, Justin's comment about the supply chain. Uh, uh, one of our next focus areas is on um, codifying controls, but that's sort of tied, I think, with the uh, supply chain and SDLC. Um, so. Um, yeah, more, more to come in that space. And then really just don't want to reinvent the wheel or replicate things and certainly not do it within the FSUG if it already exists somewhere else. And yeah, I, th I think perhaps we have a, a separate conversation or a side conversation about that. That'd be useful. Yeah, and I think that the work you're doing, I think this is one of the neat things about this group is that it can, it includes the people who make the software as well as the people who, you know, the red team people who make sure it's trying to break it. And, um, and there, this, I wonder if there are things that you came across that shouted out to you like, oh, wow, if this was built differently, this wouldn't be so hard. Um, th there were, um, and uh, I noted a couple of them down, we should probably sort of rehash them. And, and that was actually one of the reasons for doing some of this work is that Actually, if we identify certain issues or certain areas, we could have a discussion with uh, uh, teams upstream and, and, and make it so. I mean, the, the, the one universal uh, aim for some of this work is the automated testing and the automated uh, sort of control or security validation. Yes. So, so yeah. if, we ha if we had the ability upstream that in addition to Kubernetes, we are also able to either run Kubernetes itself through an SDLC that validated its security by validating that threat model, or we um, have effectively a financial services test pack that our members can validate and, and, and use. Instead of every single financial institution or member of FSUG standing up a 10 person team to learn how this works and run it, it's just not competitive advantage. It's do it once, do it upstream, and again, it's not financial services, really. It's just general security. Um, I'd be interested in seeing if we can push that. Yeah, I totally agree with that. In fact, I was going to interrupt you and make the same point. In fact, you could argue that, you know, federated DevOps is kind of a key thing that needs to happen. If you can't, you know, push the test cases through the supply chain, you can't keep up with the releases that are happening across it. And this is central to doing it. And when I try, you know, I'm involved with the Homeland Security efforts for finance and I keep trying to tell them, don't go solve the boiling ocean, right? Of 
computer security, that's not your role here. It's what does finance need? And a lot of what finance needs and these critical infrastructure, uh, what parts of the economy are tied to risk and how to tie to risk and under discover risk to uh, align your business and software engineering processes along risk. And that is something we can contribute. Whereas, you know, cryptography and signing and a lot of these other things cut across all software production. Yeah. Yeah, but it's also hard for them because even today I was talking with someone and they, they, they were saying that they are like trying to adapt this kind of risk frameworks, but then it doesn't align with the cloud native security capabilities. And that's a huge friction for them because on one side, they need to be able to be compliant and have all this regulatory, right? But at the same time, like the cloud native capabilities doesn't provide them that seamlessly. And that's a friction for them. So while I understand what you're saying, I think there's deeper problems also in the culture that they have in order for them to adopt that then becomes like a process and a people problem, I would say. Well, I, I think, well, there's, there's many problems, but I think if we had the automated testing capability up front, um, that would certainly solve uh, or help alleviate one of them. Yeah. And yeah. I'm not just talking about PCI or some of the regulatory standards. I'm talking about that plus um, basic security. Um, but then right. it gets to the point where, how do you write an automated test when, and maybe this is because we're thinking about it incorrectly, but how do you write an automated test in a way that it validates the intent of the attack, not the configuration of your server. I prefer the intent. And when you get to that, you're effectively writing an exploit, which then moved us on to well, let's talk to the breach, breach assessment teams, because that's uh, more in their uh, wheelhouse, as it were. Yeah, so, that's, yeah, yeah, sorry. It's, it's quite all right. So if I can actually just ask, so, by exploit, do you, what do you mean exactly by exploit? Because what I'm hearing regarding the test for the control is that you are basically testing both the positive and the negative, right? You know, you're testing to ensure that the control is in place and it's doing what's expected or it's not. Um, and technically speaking, these are verifiable without necessarily requiring an exploit because mm -hmm. realistically speaking, you're not necessarily trying to test an exploit for that control. You're trying to detect the presence of whether or not it's working as intended or not. Uh, in, I guess in this audience, I should be very careful when I use that, that phrase. It's, uh, um, it's not usually this sort of audience. Um, in, in reality, what I'm referring to is rather than testing to make sure that I have configured um, um, configured a particular security parameter, um, it's a better test for me if we actually try to perform that security action. So I'll stand up a privileged container and then we'll try and use that service token to hit the API server and pull all the secrets out of it. Um, and I'd rather do it that way than um, do a test that would validate, yes, you've got a pod security policy that has the preventative control in there and you don't have a security token. Because if we make a mistake or it's not applied to the appropriate namespace or Kubernetes has changed in some way that uh, means that the security feature has changed, I wouldn't know um, that that's the case. Whereas if I try to simulate the attack, um, it gives me more fidelity. I, I don't know if Robert, that answered your question, possibly not. Um, slightly, I'm, I'm just wondering if that is necessarily what would be a bad thing per se because like typically speaking if you're ensuring that a control is in place you're gonna have to test both the positive and the negative and that effectively I, classifies underneath so I'm, I'm not sure if i'm just misunderstanding I, I'm, um, I'm really sort of suggesting as, as a an fsug group we, we would probably prefer not to be writing um explanations of how to sort of test your, we're not writing exploit or um, uh, 
security penetration testing tools as part of the FSUG. Um, this is probably a, a, a great group that would be able to do that um, or be able to discuss that, but it's probably not something um, we'd want to do necessarily. Happy with the blue right. team tool, but not I think necessarily the way around. We may be able to uncover the, you know, the groups or projects that might have the, um, you know, different features or tooling that would be useful for that. Like, yeah. I'm not sure we're about to do an assessment of cloud custodian, and that might yeah. be a framework that could be applied to this problem. Sure. Sure. And it might be something where, like looking at it from a general infrastructure standpoint, more like, well, any Kubernetes deployment, like maybe it has some things that ha don't need to be authenticated because they just serve public information, right? other stuff that requires authentication. And if you look at it at a lower level, you're not saying here, let me tell you how you might be able to hack into my bank. <laughs> you're just saying, you know, if we decouple them a little bit, yeah. right? It, then it, we're it, saying, well, you have private things and public things, and this is how you look at them and how you might verify that the private thing should be private and the public thing should be public. And then you can look at it more from a, well, certain things need to be yeah. very private and other things, you know, I, I, I think that's the way to um, disconnect it. It, it. What we're really referring to is a reputational situation. We don't want the financial industry writing tools that are going to turn up in newspapers where you can, and other people of the you know, communities can, but it's it's uh, something that um, is not as easily palatable from a reputational standpoint. We'll do de development and defense all day long, but um, that's, that's for other people to to, to perhaps develop an open source. Obviously, we've already implemented this internally for multiple different banks, but it's not something that you need to open source. All right, so I, I'm gonna just interject here because we're almost at the top of the hour. Um, so um, if um, Jonathan and Andy, if you guys could share the link to the slides, um, what I'll do is I'll create an issue and then we can continue the discussion if there is any of that. Thank, thank um, you everyone for your time. I'll um, and I look forward to continuing the conversation offline. Thank you. And thank you so much for presenting. Yeah. It's fabulous. Much appreciated. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan and Andy. Yeah. Thanks. Um, before we get off, just a quick announcement. So next week is a, a working session. Uh, if you have any items or issues or PRs that you want to talk about or anything else, um, put it under the plan meeting list for next week. Uh, if I could ask a, uh, a question to the speakers, uh, um, you know, more slightly more primitive questions, I may have missed it earlier. Um, are these attack trees based on actual attacks that have been experienced in the financial service industry? or what is the basis uh, of the origin or uh, the origin for the attack trees composition here? No, it's a, it's a logical exercise of every possible thing we could think of a uh, way of attacking uh, the Kubernetes system. It's a full threat modeling exercise. It's uh, got no specific bearing um, on particular attacks. In fact, we thought about those TTPs and I think we discussed them earlier, perhaps from the MITRE attack framework. Um, that would evidence some of this information, but we, at that point, there was no information to hand, so it was a purely logical exercise. So logical from the perspective of the financial application, or any, so it has no biasing Generic. from the, so it has no biasing from the financial service industry. Correct. Okay, so it's a generic proposition. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thanks again, uh, Jonathan and Andy, and uh, thanks everyone. Let's see you next week. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Thank you. You too.